Hello, I'm Tony. In this video series, I will demonstrate how to design a distortion or overdrive effect for your guitar that produces the sound you desire. My approach will involve providing a clear framework for understanding how each part of the effect work in relation to the overall sound. While the primary factor influencing the final sound is the amplifier, the distortion of the drive effect can significantly refine this influence. We will begin by creating a minimal simple version of the effect. This will allow us to understand the fundamental principles of the circuit and how it affects the guitar sound. From there, we will gradually add more component and complexity to fine-tune the pedal performance and produce the desired sound. What does a distortion overdrive pedal do to a guitar signal? When a signal from the guitar passes through the pedal, it's amplified, compressed and distorted. In an overdrive-like pedal, the process illustrated by the animation. In an ideal voltage amplifier, the signal is only scaled in amplitude, with the scaling characterized by gain factor. However, the distortion of a drive pedal is not an ideal amplifier. This is because it operates in a nonlinear way, which can lead to signal clipping and varying level of gain across different frequencies, resulting in a distorted output signal. Distortion of a drive is a part of the electric guitar setup, and its purpose is to shape the musical sound. And the distortion effects give the guitar a new voice and character, allowing it to sync with a different tongue coloration. Simply amplifying the signal would only make it louder, without any new tonal qualities. As such, the gain of the distortion of a drive effects depend on both the frequency and input amplitude of the guitar signal. Let's examine the simplest circuit, which forms the core of the distortion effect. The circuit comprises four key blocks, the input block, an amplifier block, the clipping stage and a tone stack, which in our case is simply a volume potentiometer. Let's take a closer look at each of these blocks. And the input block has two key purposes. Firstly, it removes any DC component from the guitar signal. And secondly, it limits the current flowing through the circuit. The input stage consists of a capacitor and two resistors. R1 for current limiting and R2 is pull-down resistor that establish potential of the ground and pull the signal line down to it which helps to prevent it from floating or picking up noise. This is a commonly used reception where a clear signal level is important or we have a virtual ground potential. How does the capacitor filter the DC component? When a DC voltage is applied to the input, the capacitor charges up to this voltage via the resistor R. However, after the initial surge of current, the current flowing through the capacitor falls to zero. This is because the capacitor becomes fully charged, and there is no further flow of the current. Therefore, DC can only flow through the capacitor for a limited time. When an AC signal is applied to the input, the polarity of the voltage changes many times per second and the capacitor doesn't have time to fully charge. When a mixture of AC and DC signal is applied to the input, the DC component is filtered out by the capacitor, while the AC component flowing through the circuit without any difficulties. In other words, the capacitor removes DC biasing from the signal. The amplifier blocks scale the signals and consist of an operational amplifier and a voltage divider with two resistors, one fixed and one variable. When a signal is applied to the input of a voltage divider, it is divided between the two resistors based on their resistance values. The voltage at the point between the two resistors 
is the output voltage of the voltage divider. The output voltage can be calculated using Ohm's law. The current flow is the same for both resistors and it's equal to the applied voltage divided by the sum of the resistances. The output voltage can be determined by multiplying the current flowing through the bottom resistor. That's equal to the total current by its resistance. The operational amplifier has two input terminals, one sine and minus and one sine and plus. These terminals are named the inverting and non-inverting terminals respectively. There are one output terminal. When a voltage difference is applied to the input, it's gained infinity times. If the potential of the non-inverting terminals is greater than potential of the inverting terminals, then the output voltage must be plus infinity, otherwise it will be minus infinity. However, it's important to note that we are considering an ideal, non-existent amplifier. In the real case, the voltage will be limited by the supply. So how can we use this weird device? The concept of feedback can help us. The feedback loop is a circuit that transmits a portion of the output signal back to the input. For example, we can connect the output and inverting input, so all output signal has a return. Suppose in the initial condition the non-inverting input voltage was higher than the inverting input, say 2 and 5 volts. Our op-amp amplifies the difference to plus infinity, but all this voltage will be transmitted to the inverting input through the feedback loop. In the next moment the voltage will tend to increase to infinity from plus to volts. However, when it reaches plus 5 volts the difference in the input will be equal to zero. As a result, the non-inverting input will be mirrored by the output. The feedback type in which the control signal is opposite to the input is called negative feedback. Another observation is that an amp amp with negative feedback tends to regulate its input voltage difference to zero. Consider its circuit named buffer. Its amplification or scale factor is 1. And it's work like a repeater. However, this circuit has many applications and we usually use it due to the important properties of the op-amp. An ideal op-amp has an infinitely large input impedance, meaning that the current does not flow through the input terminals. At the same time, the output impedance tends to zero, providing output voltage stability for every load. In other words, an ideal op-amp can generate an arbitrarily large current. A real op-amp has a very large input impedance that more than 10 giga ohms and an output impedance value less than 1 ohm. Therefore, a buffer circuit can be used as an impedance converter and low power amplifier. What if we only get a part of the signal from output to input? For limited transmission, I connected the output with the inverting input via a voltage divider. In this case, a compensation mechanism must increase the output voltage for zero balance in the input terminals compared to the buffer, because the returning voltage is less than the output. What do we have? By reducing feedback we increase the output voltage. There are ways to calculate the amount of this magnification. The feedback current flows only through resistors, because as we know an op-amp input does not conduct current. We can write that feedback current is equal to output voltage divided by a sum of the resistances. To calculate the voltage value at the inverting input we can use the voltage divider formula, which gives us the expression inverting input voltage equal feedback current times R2. However, from the experiment with the buffer we know that an op-amp with negative feedback tends to maintain a zero voltage difference in the input terminals. 
Therefore, voltage for inverting input equal voltage for non-inverting and equal input voltage, that in the end equal feedback current times R2. And finally, we have that feedback current equal input voltage divided by R2. By equating expression for feedback current after some algebraic manipulation, we arrive at formula, where the multiplicator R1 divided by R2 plus 1 is scaling factor for our amplifier. We can change gain by resistor value. In our schematic, R1 is variable for this purpose. The clipping stage is responsible for introducing distortion into the signal, which creates a saturated guitar sound. This stage is made up of two diodes, which cut the signal distortion by adding new harmonics to the signal. The resulting sound is often described as jjj. A diode is a device that allows current to flow in one direction while blocking current in opposite direction. This is useful for signal rectification. When a sine voltage is passed through a diode, the negative half wave is suppressed, leaving only the positive portion of the signal. The remaining part of the signal has only one sign, and it always stays above zero. This explanation of diode is incomplete as there are many details that matter for practical applications. As we examine the rectified signal, we observe that the zero volts intervals have the same width as the sine half waves. When we began to decrease the signal amplitude, we note that the zero intervals start to expand. This occurs because the diet has its own resistance and the portion of the input voltage remains across the diode. Furthermore, the resistance of the diode depends on the applied voltage, which can further affect the shape of the rectified signal. Let's take a closer look at what happens inside the diode. When the voltage is negative, the diode exhibits a high resistance preventing the negative half waves from passing through. When the voltage is positive, we might expect the diode's resistance decrease and allow the positive half wave to pass through with easy. However, instead of clear change in resistance, we observe a 0.4 volts threshold and curve it shaped in the top of the signal. This effect can be attributed to the current voltage dependence of the diode. Consider the IV curve of the diode and resistor. Its curve is a graphical representation of the relationship between the current flowing through a device or material and the voltage applied across it. In general, the IV curve shows how the current through a device changes in response to a changing voltage. It is often used to describe the behavior of electronic components such as diodes or transistors. The curve typically shows the current on the y-axis and the voltage on the x-axis. The shape of the curve can provide valuable information about the behavior of the device. For the resistor, IV curve is a straight line. We can calculate the resistance by Ohm law graphically. Divide increment of voltage to corresponded increment of the current. In contrast to a resistor, the IV curve of the diode has a complex shape with two important regions, the negative and positive half planes. The negative half plane corresponds to a low forward voltage, belong which the diode does not conduct electricity. The positive half plane corresponds to a higher forward voltage above which the diode start conducting electricity. The negative half plane shows that the diode is closed until the reverse voltage reaches the breakdown point. At this point a regular diode may emit smoke, but there are special diodes that can operate in this regime. However, our interest lies in the positive half plane. 
The current through the diodes does not increase rapidly at first, but its growth speed dramatically increases with the voltage. This type of dependence is named exponential. In simple terms it means that when the current is growing exponentially, it grows faster and faster with increasing voltage. We cannot talk about the diode's resistance itself, as its resistance is not constant. In this case we talk about the differential resistance. The differential resistance is determined at a specific point on the current voltage graph, as a slope of the tangent line that's colored green on a picture for a simple resistor with a constant resistance value, the differential resistance is equal to the resistance value itself. You can see from a graph that the slope of the tangent line for the resistor is constant and equal to R, which is the resistance value of the resistor. However, for more complex components like a diode, the differential resistance may vary from point to point, and it's not constant. At the zero point volt, the slope is negligible and the resistance is high. At the zero point four volts, the slope gets stepper and the resistance decrease. Returning to our graph of the voltage drop on the diode, we can see that the cutoff curve corresponds to the changing differential resistance. The current voltage curve of the diode defines the shape of the signal cutoff. Different type of diodes has a different current voltage dependencies. As a result, the type of diode determines the final distorted sound. In our clipping stage, diodes are connecting in both directions. This connection allows for symmetrical clipping with both half waves. The degree of clipping is proportional to the input voltage. Therefore, it works like a compressor limiter which regulates the loudness of sound and normalizes the dynamic range of audio signal. Let's review the main parts of our setup once again. The input stage receives a signal from outside, filters out the DC component and passes the AC signal. The amplifier increases the amplitude of the signal. The clipping stage cuts off the peaks that saturate and compress the signal. The volume potentiometer adjusts the volume. If you don't fully understand all the details of how the components work together, don't get frustrated. In the next video I will conduct experiments on each part and demonstrate how theory meets practice. I suggest performing a sound check of our minimal working example. The setup was assembled on a breadboard and plugged into a clean channel of my preamp. <laughs> It sounds redundantly fuzzy and shaggy. In the next series I will explain how to fix this with tone shaping.